sober, be vigilant, uh, overcoming and understanding and overcoming the adversary. Uh, ask for your prayers on that, on Sunday, and we'll be starting that on Sunday mornings here in a couple of weeks. Just ask you to be much in prayer about that series, especially pray for me as I'm trying to put the things together. Uh, still trying to decide, you know, kind of the order of the messages and how to break things down and, and working through all of that right now. So I'd ask you all to be much in prayer about that. Uh, also next Sunday, uh, Jeff Dobbins uh, will be with us. Uh, he is uh, looking to start a boys' home there in South Carolina, uh, pretty close to the Spartanburg area is where they're out of right now anyway. And uh, he's going to be with us for a few minutes there on Sunday morning, kind of sharing that work just to ask us to pray for him and, and share what's going on there and what they're trying to accomplish. So you'll be much in prayer for him for safe travels and that kind of thing. And then, like I said, Lord willing, we'll be finishing up the Philippians study next Sunday morning as well. But tonight, uh, we're going to be in Psalm number 1. And a couple of weeks ago, we kind of introduced to this psalm and kind of gave you the big picture or 30,000 foot overview of some of the things that we're going to be talking about and tonight we're really going to begin digging in uh, to the study and looking at what this psalm has to tell us in the day that we live. The title of course of this series is Blessed is the Man. Uh, but as we talked about last time the word blessed in this passage is very much like the word blessed uh, in the Beatitudes. Uh, and that word can also uh, just as easily be translated as happy. And so we're going to be talking about happiness a lot and, and happiness within the confines of being blessed. Uh, and so we're going to be dealing with that and talking about that tonight, uh, especially looking at verse number one. Uh, but to get us started, let's go ahead and read the entire psalm, uh, just to kind of orient ourselves to the contents of this wonderful, wonderful psalm. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Let's pray. Father, how I thank you once again for the privilege that we have to be in your house tonight. Father, I pray that you just hide me behind Calvary, allow me to share the truths that you've burdened my heart with. May they touch our heart tonight and help us, Father, to have that happiness and, and and father may it be seated alongside the joy that we were even talking about this morning and may we see you may we see you live out in our lives in such a way that people can truly understand that being a christian is more than a name it's more than a title it truly is a way of life father we love you and we thank you and we praise you for all that you're going to do we ask it in jesus name amen Amen. As we said last time, this particular psalm has been described by different people throughout the ages as kind of the summary psalm of the entire book. Within these six short verses, we see all the same themes that you really see repeated throughout the other 149 psalms that we have in the scriptures. Uh, but in this, uh, we see them you know, in greater detail, but the seed is kind of sown here in this first chapter or this first psalm as we look at it. So to study this particular psalm is to get an overview of the heart and the mind of God as he moved on men to write these songs of worship. Now, the overriding theme of this particular psalm is that happiness, that being blessed, that happiness is based on choosing to live in a godly and a righteous way. It's based on obedience. Happiness comes from obedience, but the desire for obedience has to be accompanied by a delight in the very words of God that have been given to us as such a treasure. That's what it tells us in verse number 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And that delight in the word comes because of our love for the Lord and our desire to know him more intimately. 
What's critical to understanding this is that the, it's the law of the Lord and that it is His law. So what we see is the necessity of spending time in the Word of God, but more importantly, also having a relationship with the God of the Word. What this psalm is doing is highlighting not just righteousness, but it's also highlighting a right relationship with the Lord. And that relationship-fueled godliness is the foundation for the Christian's happiness. Now, for instance, the first thing that we see in this psalm in verse 1 is that happiness is the result of a right decision. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. First, we see there a description of what the blessed man doesn't do. But in addition to that, we see in this verse a commendation of the choice that the blessed man has made. It says, blessed is the man that doesn't do these things. And that brings us to our first point, which is that happiness is often related to our choices. Again, blessed is the man. The Bible tells us here. This tells us that happiness is as much decision or as much choice-based as it is a result of particular circumstances. And, and this, is enti- this is entirely different than the way most people, especially the lost, view happiness. Most of the time, people view happiness as being based on our circumstances. Things make us happy. Not having things makes us unhappy. My life being just like I pictured it makes me happy. But if things aren't going my way or things aren't meeting my expectations, then I'm unhappy. But what the Bible says here is that happiness will come when I choose to live obediently and righteously and nurture my relationship with God. Peter spoke about this in his first epistle. I don't often do this, but I want you to have your Bibles in front of you because I want you to see these verses as we read them. Go with me, if you will, to 1 Peter chapter number 3. And then we're going to jump to chapter 4. But first off, start in 1 Peter chapter number 3. First Peter chapter 3, verses 14 through 16. Now, look at the contrast or the kind of almost what we would think of as an oxymoronic statement in verse 14. But, and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. Doesn't that sound kind of weird? If you suffer, you ought to be happy. That don't sound like anybody I know you. But if, And if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are you. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you, a reason of the hope that is in you uh, with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Then flip over to chapter 4 and look at verse 14. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. Doesn't that sound kind of strange? If people make fun of you for being a Christian, if people mock you for being a Christian, if people take the fact that you're a Christian and they use that against you, happy are ye. Does that sound like anything you ever thought about? For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he's glorified. Suffering is not something that we normally see as leading to happiness. Being berated and put down and ridiculed for our stand is not something that we view as bringing happiness. But despite that's not how we view things, the Scripture tells us here that it can and it does and it should bring happiness. But here's the reason why. It's because 
of the choices that we make. Jump back to 1 Peter 3 just a second. But back to 14. But, but, and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are you, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that's in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. According to 1 Peter 3, verses 15 and 16 that you're looking at there, happiness results when I suffer for Christ because I have, put, I have put God in the right place in my heart. I can be happy because I'm sharing what Christ has done for me. I choose to share what Christ has done for me. I choose to live in a way that brings God honor. So yes, the suffering is not something that's going to be bring joy. It's not going to bring happiness. But in that situation, I can choose to use that situation in a way that brings honor to Christ. And when I do that, when I put him in the right place, when I share what God has done for me, when I live in a way that brings God honor, even in the midst of the suffering and even in the midst of the persecution, I can still be happy. Christ himself said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, starting in verses 10 through 12, blessed are they, same word, blessed, kind of the same thing, being happy. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Think about what we've just read in Psalm 1 and 1 Peter 3 and 4. And now looking at in Psalm or in Matthew chapter number 5. The blessed man, the happy man is among the ungodly and the sinner and the scornful. And yet he's happy. The Christian is suffering for righteousness sake. Yet he's happy. The Christian is being reproached, yet he's happy. The believer is persecuted and reviled and slandered, yet he's happy and should rejoice, the Bible says, and be exceeding glad. It's not the circumstances that lead the believer into happiness. It's the choice that we make in the circumstances we live in. But again we see another important key for how that's even possible. And that's the fact that happiness is often empowered or strengthened by a right perspective. In each of the situations that we've talked about, the one in the the Psalms, the one in 1 Peter, the one that we've talked about in in, in Matthew there in the Beatitudes, we've talked about... Uh, situations that would normally lead to unhappiness and and, and what we see in each of those verses though the reason that it ought to bring us to a the, the reason that we ought to be able to be happy in those is because we have a different perspective a different understanding or a different goal that's actually larger than the situation that would normally bring the feelings of unhappiness or discouragement or whatever what am I talking about? Well, go back to the passages from the Sermon on the Mount. Again, go with me. We don't do this often, but I want you to see this. Matthew chapter number 5. Starting there. In verse number 10. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Why? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. Why? For great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. 
We can be happy, the Bible tells us here, when we're persecuted for righteousness' sake because it's a clear indication that we're a part of the kingdom of God. We can be happy and rejoice and be exceeding glad when we're reviled and persecuted and slandered for the name of Christ because, number one, we know that we have a reward in heaven, and number two, it's a sign that we're, uh, that we're standing and presenting the truth of God to the world. And in Psalm 1, we see exactly the same kind of thing. Our happiness, now go back to Psalm 1, our happiness at avoiding the lifestyle of the ungodly, the sinner, or the scorner that it talks about here, comes, the reason we can be happy, it comes from the greater goal of stability and nourishment and refreshing that we have living the godly life. What am I talking about? Look at it. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law doth he meditate day and night. Now notice this. I'm not sitting, I'm not, stand, I'm not walking, I'm not standing, and I'm not sitting in the way of the sinful. Instead, because of that, the Bible says in verse 3, And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. When I choose to live righteously, the happiness that I have comes from the fact that my life is complete in Christ and I have all that I need to be a, to, to be a witness and a testimony and to have the strength that I need to live the life. So I can be happy in the midst of that. Not only that, it comes from having a life that's marked by stability and substance. Verse number four, the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. The Bible tells me here that because I choose to live righteously, I can be happy because, daggone it, I am rooted into something that will not let me move. In verse number 5, in verse number 6, it tells us that I can be happy because in the end, it, it, my life for Him will be vindicated before those and even by those when they're judged that now look at me as if there's something wrong with me. Look at verses 5 and 6. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. I can be happy because, because I'm His and I'm not going anywhere in the end. David spoke of that last point a lot of times. Again, we read this this morning in Psalm 3, but look at it again. Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help from, for him in God. Selah, but thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of mine head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. Selah, I laid me down and slept. I awaked for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set them themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people, Selah. And it's right here that so many believers, at least in our Western culture, why they struggle with being happy as believers. Can I put this in just as simple as I know how to put it in East Tennessee? We've got a lot of Christians who are miserable in their Christian life because they haven't really figured out or they haven't really come to the point to where they believe that what they gave up when they got saved is of less value than what they've gained in Christ. They look back at their old life and, 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 and they, they, they say, says, you know, it seems like everybody is enjoying life but me. You ever, heard, you ever heard a Christian say that? Why do they get to do all the fun stuff? Right? Why is it that the unbeliever seems to enjoy their life, but I always feel like I'm in a straitjacket because I can't do this and I can't do that? Right? 
I try to do the right thing and I'm passed over at work, but the guy that's lying and cheating and backstabbing, that's the guy that gets the promotion. Why does God allow that to happen to me? Doesn't he see how hard that I'm trying? I try to be a good Christian at school and everybody treats me like I'm some kind of leper. Everybody else is out having a good time and I'm sitting here because I don't feel like I can do nothing. I remember those days as a teenager. I look around at what people have, the things that they have that are lost, and they don't go to church, and here, here I am trying to live the way God wants me to, and I don't have any of that. I, heard, I have heard Christians make this statement. If I didn't have to tithe, now, get with what I said. If I didn't have to tithe, I could go on three vacations a year. If I didn't have to tithe, then I could have a trailer, a camper, and go where I want to go. If I didn't have to tithe, I could live in a lot nicer house. we got a lot of Christians who look at their life as a Christian, and they haven't figured out yet that what they gave up when they got saved isn't worth what they got when they did. I say that it's a common problem in Western culture. But the truth of the matter is, it's been a problem throughout history. Go to Psalm 73. Psalm 73. This is Asaph. Now, David wrote most of the Psalms. Moses wrote a few. Asaph wrote a few. There's a few others sprinkled in there. We're not really sure who wrote them. <laughs> but in this case, Asaph wrote 73. And listen to what he says. And we're going to read the whole thing, but I'm going to stop you in the middle. We're pretty close. Starting in verse 1. Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But now notice what he starts talking about here in verse 2. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They're not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain, violence cover the, covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness, they have more than heart could wish. They're corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppressions. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people uh, return hither and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, how doth God know? And is there knowledge in the most high? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily I have cleansed my heart in vain. And I have washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. Poor old Asaph was in a crisis. He says, I'm looking around. And all I see is how it looks like the wicked are prospering. And all I see is how like they're having all the fun. I see them, they're looking at God and shaking their fist at God and saying, God ain't even paying attention to what I'm doing. Look at how blessed that I am. And Asaph said, I'll be honest with you, I'm kind of tired of it. He said, I'm fed up. If this is what it means to try to follow God and all I get is the dredges and all I get is the crumbs and all I get is the leftovers, dang on it, I'm getting kind of tired of that. That's what he says. Isn't that what I was just talking about a minute ago? But now, pick up with verse 17. Until. <laughs> Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places, thou castest them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation as in a moment they're utterly consumed with terrors as a dream when one waketh. So, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved and I was pricked in my reins. So foolish was I and ignorant. 
I was as a beast before thee. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For lo, they are far from thee. They that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go a-whoring from thee. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. Asaph said, buddy, when I changed my perspective, <laughs> he said, I walked into the house of God. And it was one of them moments. You've heard people talk about this. Sometimes you come into the house of God and you can just feel him as soon as you walk in the door. It don't even matter if anybody's saying anything yet or the songs have even started. You can just feel God's presence when you walk in. Asaph said, man, when I went into the house of God, he'd hit me like a brick. What I gave up isn't nearly as important as what I'm going to get. His perspective completely changed. He said, I went from being envious, I went from looking at them and going, man, I wish that I had just a little bit of what they had. And then I turned around and I saw where they were heading and I thought, man, how stupid could I have been? That's exactly what he said. So foolish was I and ignorant. I looked at them and I got jealous, but then I looked at Jesus and I realized there's more to this thing than what they've got. And in the end, what I gave up isn't nearly as important as what I'm going to have. As believers, we have to realize, like Asaph, that we've really given up nothing when it comes to what we gave up once we became saved versus what we've got now and what we're going to have hereafter. Christ said in Matthew 19, 22, or 1929, excuse me, and everyone that hath forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. Paul when looking at the things in his life that most people would take great pride in and believe that would lead to happiness that we read about in Philippians 3, 8 said this, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. And as for the suffering or the persecution that we talked about earlier, Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 4, starting in verse 8. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus may, might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. In other words, we live to show people that Jesus is living in us. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, temporary, not going to last. But the things which are not seen are eternal. So what have we learned about biblical happiness for the believer in Psalm 1 and verse 1? First of all, our first encouragement is that happiness is as much decision or choice-based as it is a result of a particular circumstance that we happen to be living in. In other words, my happiness does not have to be dependent on my situation or my circumstances. 
We can be struck by them and we can be bothered by them. And we can look at them just like we talked about this morning and realize the reality of the situation. But that doesn't mean for a moment that we can't also look at the God who's there and the one who strengthens us and the one who guides us and the one who's promised to meet all of our needs according to his riches and glory. That despite the circumstance I face, he's still there and he's not leaving. But secondly, when we find ourselves in a situation that would normally lead uh, to or result in unhappiness, like I said, there's a way to combat it. The solution is to gain a different perspective, a, a, a different understanding, and focus on the goal that's larger than the situation that's bringing the unhappiness. And he says when we do that, then we can gain that understanding and we can gain that perspective and that helps us to be happy even in a situation and to realize just how blessed we are in a situation even when the outside circumstances themselves may not look that great. But how do we gain that perspective and understanding so that we can focus on the goal? That's what we'll talk about next time as we begin to look at verses 2 through 6. Father, I love you, and I thank you for the truth of your word. Father, how I thank you so much that you give us in your word such clear teaching. Now, Father, sometimes the application of that teaching, takes the that's what takes the work. But the blueprint, the road map, The treasure map is laid right out here for us. And you you tell us in your word that if we will choose to live righteously and obediently to you and to have that personal relationship with you, that even in the midst of circumstances that can bring great unhappiness, Because we know you're in control, because we know you're there, because we know that the end for us is better than anything we've given up, we can be happy even in the midst of the hard times. We can experience joy and happiness even in the dark times. Father, I thank you so much for what you're showing me as I'm going through this and father i pray that you'd use me to be a blessing and a help to others and we'll give you the praise and glory for all that you do we ask it in jesus name amen all hearts and minds clear all hearts and minds clear then don't forget this wednesday night we'll be talking a little bit more about the strongs but really beginning to look more at how do we, when we're looking at a passage in the epistles that deal with our duty, the things that we need to do, how do I break those passages down so I can find out what I need to do and how I need to do it and why I need to do it. That's what we're going to be talking about on Wednesday night. Then, like I said, next Sunday we'll be wrapping up the Philippian study, Lord willing. Uh, Brother Dobbins will be here talking about the uh, mission work that he's trying.